Welcome to our March chapter meeting of Wild Ones River City. Our program for tonight is titled For the Birds, Fostering Bar Backyard Habitat to Attract Birds. My name is Marty MacArthur, president of our chapter for this year. I always like to start by reading our Wild Ones mission statement. I, I think that it helps us stay connected and focused on our large endeavor that we are all involved in. Um, our mission statement is to promote environmentally sound landscaping practices to provide diversity through preservation, restoration, and the establishment of native plant communities. One of the silver linings of this pandemic for me has been the multitude of webinars that I have been able to learn from and enjoy during these past few months. This past week, I virtually attended a series of programs from the Aldo Leopold Foundation in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Aldo Leopold is considered to be one of the leaders in the recognition of the need for a land ethic. Aldo Leopold continuously saw the value in the relationships between people and their relationship with nature and the land. On Wednesday, March 10th, the webinar opened with a statement of gratitude to the native people of the area on which the farm and land of the Leopold Foundation exist. They thanked the Ho-Chunk, Sauk, and Fox tribes for the care of the earth on which the foundation now exists. I began to think about our land in the Grand Rapids area and read in an online article by Rachel Ocampo from the Collegiate, December 13th, 2013 edition that shared the following facts, quote, Native people known as the Anishinaabe or three fires as they are known in their culture are mostly comprised of the Ottawa, Chippewa and Potawatomi tribes. They lived in the Grand Rapids area for over 11,000 years before white Europeans arrived. They called this area Bo E Ting. Their lives and culture were deeply intertwined with nature and we are grateful for their knowledge and care of the land. As Wild Ones River City, we acknowledge their wisdom in our motto, healing the earth one yard at a time. We are just a few days away from the official start of spring. The sunshine that we've recently enjoyed is a welcome harbinger of brighter, warmer days. There is also the anticipation of all the life we will be seeing in our native plant gardens as we enjoy the familiar and the new plants in our yards and gardens. I do have a few announcements. Our June program had to be changed. We're not having our June field trip. The title for our new program will be Go Beyond Beauty, and it will be presented by Shelley Stusick from the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network, and that will be virtual. Uh, my second announcement has to do with um, the potential for many more upcoming activities. Um, we would like to encourage you to consider having a walkabout. Now, for those not familiar with this term, a walkabout is an opportunity to visit a person's garden and to see how this person has incorporated native plants into the landscape. Let me tell you what it is not. It's not an inspection tour. It's like an open house. You may get an idea for something you would like to try. All of us know the journey that to incorporate native plants is different for each of us and how we approach the task is also unique for each of us. This can be a fun way to get together to talk about native plants and enjoy some time with kindred spirits. So far, we have one walkabout on the calendar and that will be on July 28th from 6 to 8 p.m. There will be more specific information as we get closer to the date in the e-news at the beginning of the month of July. If you have ever thought that you might like to share what you have done with your yard or garden, we'd love to have some more walkabouts to put on our calendar. You may contact me through the website, rivercitywildones.org, and we will add your name, the date and time that you would like to the calendar. Now, Linda Gary, our vice president and chairperson for the program committee will introduce our speaker for the evening. Linda. 
Thanks, Marty. Um, welcome to all of you to our program tonight. Um, this is our River City Wild Ones March program. Curtis Dykstra is our presenter tonight, and he will be giving us some great ideas uh, for making our yards a more welcoming place for birds. Curtis is a park naturalist with Ottawa County Parks and a lifelong birder. Before I introduce him, um, I just want to go through a couple of housekeeping um, details. Um, our program tonight will last, I don't know, half hour, maybe 45 minutes. And after that, there will be some time for questions. Um, most of you are familiar with um, these Zoom meetings and webinars and such, but just um, in case some of you are not, I want you to um, pay attention to a couple of buttons on the lower part of your Zoom screen. There is a chat button there. That is um, for you. If you have some comments to make during Curtis's presentation, you may type it in there. We will also be posting some um, website links um, on the chat box um, for your um, for you to, to learn more about um, Curtis's uh, topic tonight. Um, Curtis has uh, put together a very comprehensive list of resources, and that document is um, also uh, listed in the chat box. Uh, you also get a follow up email. Um, on Wednesday uh, about this presentation and the link to Curtis's resource list will be there also. Another button I'd like to call your attention to is the Q&A button. That's at the bottom of your screen also. Um, that if you have any questions during Curtis's uh, presentation, please type them out and we will be able to um, ask Curtis those questions at the end of his presentation. Um, so Curtis graduated from Dork College in Sioux City, Iowa with an environmental studies degree in 1999. He's been a state park ranger in Eastern North Carolina and assistant director of outdoor ed education at Camp Rogers in Rockford. And um, since 2013, he has served as a parks naturalist for Ottawa County. Curtis has had a passion for birds his entire life since he started watching birds in his parents' um, backyard bird feeder. Um, now he is watching birds both at his home uh, with his family as well as on the trails and at the bird viewing station at Hemlock Crossings where he works. Um, he loves figuring out new ways to attract birds into his yard so he and his family can watch them and he loves finding ways to um, improve habitat for birds. So I hope you'll please welcome Curtis. Good evening and thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, honored to be a part of your group tonight and your meeting and to share a little bit of what I've learned along the way about fostering backyard habitats to attract birds. And I like how you described it in your mission statement. You know, that We're all at different places and, and we all have different processes of going about it. And I, I feel honored to be able to share some of what I've learned along the way with all of you today. So with that, for the birds, fostering backyard habitats to attract birds. Before I dive into the meat of the presentation, I would like to give you just an overview of Ottawa County Parks. Um, Ottawa County Parks is uh, not far from Grand Rapids, obviously where you're neighboring county. Um, so we're very easily accessible to the Grand Rapids area. We have 40 park properties and over 7,000 acres to explore. There are 28 parks, 12 open spaces, which function more like uh, state game lands with uh, looser rules on them and less, less development, um, and 28 parks, which are more uh, developed with maps and facilities and things like that. There's a map on the screen there, but obviously you can go to the website myottawa.org slash parks to find out more. If you don't remember the website, it's really easy. Just Google search Ottawa County Parks and you'll come up with it. One of the things that highlights the nature of the, the uh, park system is the Nature Center. And that is actually where I work um, at, the Hemlock, at Hemlock Crossing County Park. Hemlock Crossing is the number 11 on your screen there that you see. Um, and uh, uh, we, we do lots of uh, public and private programming out, out of the Nature Center for school groups, for public groups. Um, uh, year round, we function out of there. And I'm, right now I am not at the Nature Center, but I will be moving back in the next week, uh, full time back to the Nature Center. So that's good news that we're uh, adjusting back to that. The Nature Center is open right now, 
Um, and it is open Tuesday through Saturday from nine in the morning till five in the evening. Um, and it is also open on Sundays from noon till five. Um, but not all of the facilities are open. And unfortunately, the next thing I'm gonna show you here, our wildlife den, which is in the nature center, is not yet open, but it probably will soon be open. It's a smaller room. Uh, so we, we will have to limit numbers of people in there. But this is one of the highlights of the nature center where people can come and watch the birds and relax. We've got a nice couch and uh, lounge chairs in there to, to, watch, to sit in and watch the birds. Um, so you're welcome to come um, when that room opens back up. You can always call the nature center, the numbers on your screen there um, to find out when we uh, open up that room again. Um, I will say, well, and I'll get into it more, um, actually by the end of this month, our feeders will have to close down due to an invasive species called the hemlock woolly adelgid. And I hope to get to that a little bit later in my presentation. But uh, the window right here looks out on our bird feeder station. So this gives you a little bit of a feel of what it looks like. Um, of course, uh, you see it a little better in person. Um, and with a little less snow now, I took this picture not that long ago when the snow was melting, um, but it is a nice place to come and enjoy the birds. And if you've been tuned into some of the programs that I have been doing, uh, you may get to see the bird, you may have been able to see the bird feeders throughout the winter, and I can tell you more about that later. But uh, we've done a copy with the birds online uh, YouTube live program um, where we've had uh, video work of the bird feeders live uh, for people to enjoy and then discussing birding topics. So that's been fun. So now on to our topic. Um, how can we foster backyard hab habitats to attract birds? How can we intentionally do that? They don't just come automatically, right? And I think a lot of you probably know that from your experiences. Um, it doesn't happen automatically. So how can we be more intentional about um, adjusting our habitats in our backyard? Because that's what they are. They are habitats. And they either work or they don't work for birds. And uh, we, we, I hope that my experience can aid you in your process in your yard. What I've done may not look exactly like what you do um, in the end, but hopefully you can get some tidbits of things uh, along the way to make adjustments to your own yard to help attract birds. But to do so, you see the thinker on here, right? How can you do this? Um, you really need to learn how to think like a bird. And I'm gonna say this over and over, and that's why I have this over here to, to uh, my left. Um, this is to remind you, think like a bird. Through the presentation, this, this picture will, will be up next to me as your reminder. Um, there's another reminder up here, and we'll get to this in a minute. Um, to my, up uh, over my right shoulder there. It's actually over my right shoulder. I think, I don't know if it flips on your screen there, but uh, this, this will also be referenced through the presentation. What, when you think like a bird, um, you need to think, what are the essential things to your survival? I mean, get into the brain of a bird, get into the mind of a bird to really know what they need. And those, three elements, we can boil it down to these, food, water, and shelter. Simply put, these are the essential elements of attracting birds. If you keep these three elements in mind and what you do in your yards, it will help in attracting birds. And this, these three things will take us beyond just the bird feeders and into the realm of habitat creation, because it is more than just sticking a bird feeder up in your yard. Although that is the first thing that we're gonna dive into uh, because it is an essential element. So let's, let's do this. How do we turn angry birds in your yard who are upset because they don't have the habitat they need, the food, the water, and the shelter, these three items, how do we make them, how do we turn angry birds in your yard into happy birds? That's what I hope uh, to show you. And that by, uh, Combining these three elements and having them work in concert with each other, birds are happiest. So the first element is food. What do birds really want when it comes to food? There are lots of different types of food on the market. 
lots of things to choose from and it can become overwhelming. And so what I like to do is just offer my two cents on if you were to pare it down to a few things, what would they be? The essentials, the, the most uh, attractive feeds for birds. And the number one attractive bird seed for, for uh, birds in your yard would be black oil sunflower seed, the number one. You can get black oil sunflower seed as a whole um, in the in the hull, or you can get it as a no mess, uh, which you can see pictured on your screen there, both of them. The uh, the uh, in the hull on the left and the um, no mess or hullless on the right. The hullless is a little bit more expensive and it can spoil a little bit faster because it's not protected, but it also is easier access for birds. So birds even with smaller beaks can eat that as well as the birds that could uh, have larger beaks. So um, it all depends on what you want. And if you want to avoid messes in your yard, the no mess is a good option. There's lots of different ways to feed the, uh, to, to feed this seed to, to birds, anywhere from tube feeders, like you see on the left, to this larger tube feeder with the cage around it, which keeps bigger birds out that may scare off the smaller birds. It also helps to keep squirrels at bay uh, to, a, to a degree. Um, you could do hopper feeders like the one in the center on the bottom, um, and that, that reduces the amount of time that you have to go out there and keep filling them. Um, you got tray feeders too, which is open air tray feeders. Those are a good way to do it. I particularly like the one in the upper right corner, the mesh feeder, um, and birds can cling onto the sides and grab it, or they can uh, perch on the tray down in the on, on the bottom of it. One of the favorite uh, feeders for house finches and for cardinals is this squirrel proof hopper feeder. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is, is if you like cardinals, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that they like to eat straight on. They don't like to turn, they don't like narrow perches. They're a little bigger than the other birds. So keep that in mind. They like to eat, be able to turn straight on to eat their food. So another type of food is the black uh, niger or thistle seed. And this is uh, something that is really useful in attracting finches, in particular gold finches, which we have year round here in Michigan, um, but also pine siskins and common red pole, as you see on the screen there. Um, this is a very small seed and um, it can go bad pretty quickly if it's not cared for. So you need to pay special attention to make sure that this uh, stays fresh. One of the ways you can do that is by agitating your feeders uh, at, when you go and feed the birds, just taking it down and turning it back and forth um, to, keep it, to keep it stirred up. Um, if you let it sit too long, it, it can cake together. And especially if there's moisture, it can get wet and you wanna avoid that, obviously. You wanna keep your feeders nice and clean. Um, different ways to, to feed this to the finches would be um, the sock feeder, which is the real simple and, and inexpensive way to do it. And this might be a good way to test it out, see if you get uh, goldfinches to your area. Real, real cheap to get this uh, sock material from, uh, from the store and uh, from, from a bird feeding store and just throw the seeds in it and uh, works like a charm. Um, the other one that is becoming less desirable is the one with the yellow cap and the yellow bottom. Um, it's got perches on it, but it has limited numbers of perches. So um, you can only see a certain number of birds and it also uh, encloses moisture more. So, so the, the type that I've been moving toward is those on the right side. That's the same feeder in both of those pictures. You can see it, it works for all three finches, right? Um, and it, uh, it's a mesh so that they can cling to the sides. Um, and uh, I've seen more than a dozen on that feeder at one time. Whereas the other one there with the yellow, you can only see about six at a time. So there's some good options for you. Um, when you feed birds, keep in, in mind that a diversity of types of seed and where and ways in which you feed it, see, uh, in, in which you feed it to them is critical. Um, and that means different locations too. So on the ground and at feeders, there are certain birds that prefer to feed on the ground, such as the fox sparrow here in this picture, the dark-eyed junco and American tree sparrow, which um, those two can be seen all, all winter long. Fox sparrow typically in migration. Um, cardinals also have a preference for being on the ground, although they will come up to feeders, they do like to be on the ground too. So when you offer it in a diversity of locations and types of feeders, it allows more birds to partake of the food that you're offering. 
Now the ground mix, um, I've kind of figured out my own mix and I want you to caution you on picking up uh, mixes at the store because um, a lot of those have a lot of junk seeds in it that will just, um, uh, just make a mess. And so what I've ended up doing is kind of making my own mix and where you can find millet and cracked corn and black oil sunflower seed and mix them together, that seems to be a good mix to attract a lot of birds and doesn't have as much mess behind. And uh, the squirrels like it um, as well as the birds. So it kind of helps to keep the squirrels at bay too when you can offer them something on the ground, then they don't feel as apt to climb up on your feeders and eat, your, uh, eat the food out of your feeders. Also, um, suet. A lot of people ask me about suet. And suet is a great way to attract, in particular, woodpeckers, but there are more birds than just woodpeckers that are attracted to suet. Um, and to boil it down to uh, how to choose one, basically the highest fat content that you can find is the best way to offer suet. So if you're buying a packaged suet, like you see in the upper right corner there, the best thing that you can do is actually um, look close at the package and look for that crude fat content on, uh, it, that's in, in the product. The higher that number, the better. If you're above 30, you're doing okay. You're doing pretty good. If you can get above 40 or 50, you're doing really good on those packaged ones. Um, the ones that I typically get are peanut or woodpecker suets. Those tend to be the best. Um, but uh, just look at that number um, and that'll give you a good clue. Um, you can always go with raw suet, like you see in the bottom uh, in the middle uh, of the screen there. And uh, you, I would recommend that you talk to your local butcher uh, about if they have any leftover suet, or if you know anybody that cuts, cuts beef, um, ask them if, if you can have their leftover suet. Um, you can cut it up, you can freeze it, um, or you can render it yourself by boiling it, straining it, and then putting it into forms. Some people like to do that too. But that is 100% uh, uh, fat, so it's a great food for birds. In particular, woodpeckers. You can see the downy and the hairy woodpeckers in the picture here. Um, but also other birds, like the pine warbler you see there. They wintered in North Carolina where I used to live and I took that picture down there. They were always a bright spot in the middle of the winter down there. Although we don't get them here during the winter, we do have them as uh, breeders um, in our pine forests. Um, I will note too that other birds will come to suet. So even your chickadees and titmice and your local resident birds, um, they'll also come to feed on the suet. And real quickly too, I wanted to mention hummingbirds and orioles. This always seems to be a very popular topic, but before I get into the uh, in, in depth, um, you can find this video, you can see in my bottom left corner that I made, it's about a four minute video and you can find that online um, uh, in our backyard segment of uh, uh, backyard habitat segment on, on our website. So, and I'll tell you more about that in the resources a little bit later. But uh, the saucer style, just keep in mind, is the best because it's easiest to clean um, and easiest to see the birds as they perch all the way, you can see all the way around the saucer. Um, and nectar, just keep in mind, a four parts water to one part sugar for hummingbirds and a six parts water to one part sugar for Orioles. Um, you want to make sure that you clean them twice a week. Um, and uh, if you want Orioles uh, offering oranges and uh, organic type jelly with real sugar in it um, instead of the, the high fructose corn syrup, those are your best options there. And uh, again, you can watch this video um, uh, and, and uh, find the link online there. Um, it's a real great way to, to uh, remind yourself. And, and I will say this too, end of April is the week that you want to get your feeders up. If you want to beat beat the Orioles and the hummingbirds to the punch, uh, do it before you get to May, because um, then that's, that's about when they arrive. Um, I, oh, I also get a lot of questions about these particular problems, uh, the birds at, at, uh, at the feeders problems. Um, squirrels, first of all, real quickly, how do you prevent squirrels? Well, I think it's more of a deter squirrels than absolutely to uh, keep them off of your feeder at 100%. And we all, I, I think, like them to a degree. They're fun to have in your yard. So first of all, you wanna prevent access to the, to, the, uh, bir to the birds from getting onto your feeder, or excuse me, from the squirrels getting onto your feeder. So if you look at the bottom right corner of uh, the screen there, I've got a picture 
where um, I have a couple of X's. Shrubs real close to underneath your feeder allow the squirrel to climb up and jump over above your baffle. Um, overhanging branches, even 10 feet above your feeder, um, the squirrels will drop out of it. They'll, they'll break ribs to get into your feeders, and I've seen it. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, sometimes you can manage with a, with a branch overhead for a while, but once they figure it out, if they get on your feeder too, too much, you may want to consider if you've got to take it down or just move your feeder. Also, you want your feeder about five to eight feet up off the ground and a baffle about four feet off the ground on the pole. Those things will really help to deter squirrels. I know not everybody's yard situation looks just like this, but hopefully these are some tools that can uh, aid you in deterring squirrels from getting onto your feeder and eating you out of house and home. Food preferences. Um, like I said, throw the food on the ground. Um, cracked corn and a few black oil sunflower seeds that that often keeps them at bay um, and they, they uh, appreciate that and then they, they have to do less work to get to the food. Um, also, if you just give them a feeder that, to, the, to, the, to themselves and put cracked corn in it, that uh, is real cheap and uh, the squirrels really like it. So that can also be um, a, a positive for them. Hawks, what can I say? Cooper's hawks, sharp shinned hawks. Um, are common visitors to our feeder. Well, you know, it is a bird feeder. That's my philosophy. Um, they've got to eat too. And, and so they're taking advantage of, of birds at your, at your feeder uh, the same way that the birds are taking advantage of the seeds that you're feeding. So, um, but if you are having too many visits at your feeder, um, one thing that you can do is just take your feeders down for a little while, for a few days, and try to get the hawk to take your yard off its regular routine. Because they do, they cycle through yards um, and uh, will visit multiple yards and kind of try to change up when they visit each one because they don't want to become too regular, otherwise the birds will always be alert to them. Um, but uh, you can kind of take them, uh, take yourself off their map if you take your feeders down for a few days. Otherwise, just uh, enjoy the nature show out your window. Cats tend to be a real big problem too. They're one of the biggest uh, killers of birds in backyards. Um, so we always say, keep your cats indoors. Um, it's safer for the cats, it's safer for the birds. And birds will, uh, cats will eat birds, whether they're being fed their kibble at home or not. Um, and, and so it's, um, it's been, been a, a real problem to control cats, but if you wanna uh, encourage your neighbors to keep their cats indoors, or if they're resistant to that, one of the things, one of the things you can do is actually ask them, hey, well then at least just put a bell on them. If, if they wear a bell, then, they're, uh, then the birds become alerted to their presence and uh, they can, they can uh, get away before the, the cat can capture them. And the last thing uh, with problems is windows. You know, a lot of questions about windows. One of the things people don't realize is that the distance to the window is actually a, a really key factor in preventing window strikes. The, the worst zone is actually from five to 10 meters uh, away from your window. It's just far enough that they can get enough speed um, when they're in a hurry to hit your window and do some damage. Um, so closer than that is better really close to your window is actually uh, better yet, um, or further away so that they have time to veer away from your home. Now, if that's not practical for you, then some of the things you can do would include um, decals. A lot of people like to put up decals, but if you wanna be effective enough with decals, you gotta put a lot of them on your windows. Um, enough so that there's only four inch spaces between each decal all over your window. So that might, deter you from putting decals up. Unless some people put strip decals. Every four inches, they put a strip decal, a kind of a translucent decal. Um, you can find those online. Um, and there's some resources in, in uh, your uh, PDF that I sent um, that will direct you to that. Uh, the American Bird Conservancy is a good place to start. But one of the things that we've found effective at the Nature Center is using this, uh, uh, cord, this, this uh, netting that you see pictured on the screen. And the netting actually is produced to cover berry bushes to keep birds off of it. So what you can do is string that up in front of your window um, in, a, in a tight manner so, that it, so it's nice and tight. You can put hooks in the corners and stretch it out if you, if you want. 
um, because it provides both a visual barrier, but also a physical barrier. If they do run into it, they bounce off. Um, the visual barrier is not a huge deterrent to you looking out the window either. So it ends up working really, really well. Um, and we've had great success with it at our bird feeders at uh, the Nature Center. Another way that you can do it is by using P cord, just real thin uh, cording and that you hang them from uh, above, from your roof, above your windows in four, four inches apart. Every four inches have one hanging. Now that's not a physical barrier, but what it is is a visual barrier for the birds. And yet you can still see through the cord and not be uh, uh, distracted with the cord so much. And you can even still take pictures through the cord, through the cording. So um, I've talked to people that have had good success with that also. So like I said, beyond the feeders, that's kind of the little overview there of um, feeding birds with bird feeders. And like I said, that's a really essential way to provide for birds. And it's also, uh, it also provides a way for us to be able to see them very easily too. Um, so feeders do factor into the equation. Some people may choose to put them up, some people not. That's why I wanted to address it in the program, but I wanted to go beyond that because bird feeders are not always just a, a thing that you buy at the store and put seed in. Bird feeders can also be native plantings um, such that produce seed, berries, and insects for the birds. Um, there's some really great resources that you can take a look at. Um, I believe I have it right at the top of my resource list that I provided for you. Um, but the Michigan Audubon Society has a great website with a couple of PDFs that really lay out um, different types of wildflowers and shrubs and trees and things to use in your yards, um, in your own situations based on shading and things like that um, to attract birds, to provide, and it splits it up by providing seeds, berries, insects, uh, um, also shelter and things like that. So. A um, really great website. I gleaned some off of that from some other places and from my own yard. I've got several of these plant species here that seem to attract birds real well. So a lot of them are asters um, in general, um, but the sunflowers from Helianthus, um, smooth aster is a good one, prairie dock uh, from Silphium, uh, purple cone flowers are really great at attracting, especially the finches and things. Um, Coreopsis the seed heads that develop are really, uh, really uh, good at attracting birds. Coneflower, uh, black-eyed Susan, Rebecca, anything Rudbeckia um, is also good, and the goldenrods. Goldenrods do a good job of attracting a lot of insects too, as do all of these flowers, but particularly go the goldenrods, I see a lot of insect activity on them, as well as seeds that uh, the birds will eat. So that's a bit for, for some wildflower suggestions where you could get started. But again, I want, want to emphasize to you that uh, you that you look at uh, the, the websites up there. Also the Bringing Nature, to, Bringing Nature Home uh, by Doug Tallamy, the book, uh, well-known book uh, dealing with this subject. Um, and that website is also on the resource list too. Um, I will mention too, I'm using a lot of the photos from a website, um, michiganflora.net. And that's the University of Michigan Herbarium website. That's a really fun website. If you know what plants you're looking for, it gives you a lot of great in information. Or if you're looking for a family of plants, it labels them as native or not native and, and gives you uh, a lot of great information, background information. So uh, bookmark that one too, miflora.net. Um, and, uh, oh, excuse me, michiganflora.net. Um, great website to use. Oh, and what I should what I should be saying here is notice in the upper left corner what I added. I had the plate, the knife, spoon, fork, but on top of that now I have the home for shelter, symbolizing shelter. Because what we feed to birds, is in particular when we when we provide native uh, native wildflowers and, and native plants, we're providing also shelter. So you'll notice that shelter touches the other two. Uh, pretty critically, the other two things, water and food. So keep that in mind that this also provides shelter. Um, wildflowers for hummingbirds, particularly uh, nectar producing ones, those in the Monarda uh, family, or genus, excuse me, 
uh, bergamot, bee balm, horsemint, those are great ones. Um, Indian paintbrush, uh, cardinal flower and columbine, uh, wild blue phlox, that's the, the native uh, phlox. Um, the beard's tongue, uh, penstemon, uh, those are, are good. And you can see how the, the flowers are formed so that the, the, uh, the hummingbird bill would fit in there real nice. And one that a lot of people don't realize, and if you've got a wet yard or uh, um, a wet area in your yard, spotted jewelweed is a, is a great uh, plant for hummingbirds in particular because it's a late bloomer. And so when they're in their migration and their southward migration in, in early fall, um, that, that is a critical plant for them. So keep that in mind if you have that particular habitat. I like to point that one out. It is a uh, wet soil loving plant, however. So notice that I'm going up in layers, okay? We're gonna get into habitat, um, or excuse me, um, into shelter in a little bit. But notice that um, we're kind of going up in layers. We, we started out with, a, with flowers, the wildflowers. Now we're going up to, into shrubs and mid-story trees. This is really important when thinking about, uh, think, when thinking like a bird um, and providing for them things at all layers of uh, habitat, all layers of your yard, all the way up to your canopy. So now let's go up a little higher than wildflowers into shrubs and mid-story trees. Service berry is a really great uh, uh, tree to, to uh, attract insects, um, also food, um, the berries. Um, high bush cranberry is a great option. Um, likes a little bit wetter soil, but uh, again, that, that uh, is a really good one. Sumac, a lot of people don't think of sumac as a, as a great bird food, but it is. I've seen many birds uh, feeding on sumac. And as the winter goes on, you'll notice that these sumac uh, clusters, that's the bottom left picture there, that the, the sumac seeds um, disappear off of these plants. Um, a lot of our local birds eat on them. I've seen everything from woodpeckers and chickadees and, and all the like uh, feeding on these berries. So great, uh, a great plant to uh, attract birds. Um, next to that, we've got raspberries and blackberries, any of your uh, rubus species, um, your natives. Um, are really uh, uh, attractive to birds as well as a lot of other wildlife that would like to eat that. And maybe even you or me. Um, hawthorns too, uh, critigus, uh, punctata in, in particular, but uh, there's a, uh, a lot of, well, there's, there's native uh, species of hawthorn. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a great option. Um, and uh, crab apple, the American crab apple. There's a lot of varieties of crab apple, but this malice, uh, Corona, corona, coronaria is, is also uh, a native, so uh, consider that too. And then the canopy trees. This is really interesting because um, you might not think of canopy trees as, as something that, that attract the birds for food, but actually they do. Um, in particularly white and red oaks. Um, and those of you who have read Doug Tallamy, you know that this is his favorite tree for birds. Why? Because it supports over 530 species of caterpillars, like what you see on the screen. All these little green caterpillars that drop out of the trees and, you know, drop onto you when you're hiking or that you see on the ground. All of these guys are, that's bird food. Um, and that's a really important source of food for birds. And the, the uh, oaks are the top of the line when it comes to providing a diversity of uh, uh, caterpillar species for birds. So white oak and red oak are uh, a great choice. Not only that, but they also produce mast, um, which can be great for other bird species and other wildlife too. Um, but uh, white oak by far is the best species to provide uh, food for your, for, uh, for birds. Some species, when not native species, can produce anywhere, um, can, can uh, support uh, all the way down to zero species of caterpillars. And that becomes invisible to us because these things are so small. You don't realize that one tree, even if it's the same size, can, can harbor zero caterpillars versus an oak tree, which can harbor over 500 species. So native is the way to go um, and, and uh, in attracting uh, native insects, which attracts birds. Black cherry is also high on that list. And not only does it uh, attract a lot of insects, but it also produces nice berries that the birds love to eat. So black cherry, 
Um, red and sugar maple are also good. Um, in particular in the spring, you see the picture down there on the bottom. These little flowers here are eaten up by birds. Um, a lot of birds will like to eat that and they get a little bit of shot of energy with the nectar and, and such. So, um, but uh, uh, maples are also good. And Eastern white pines. We don't often think about white pines as, excuse me, as, as, produce, as providing food, but they do. Um, the seeds are eaten by a lot of different local birds. Um, and not just the rare ones like the uh, crossbills and things like that, but actually our local birds like uh, blue jays and chickadees and nuthatches and things like that will also eat these seeds. And another thing to mention when it comes to native plantings for birds, um, for bird food, um, when providing seeds and berries and insects, um, messy yards are best. Um, Messy yards um, help to uh, provide bre breeding success for songbirds in the spring. And it starts, like, it, like this uh, poster here says, it starts with winter habitat, leaving your uh, seed heads on the plants in your garden. Um, and that's, that's where the birds need it the most. That's when they need it the most is during the winter. And it helps them to successfully, to, to uh, um, be healthy enough by spring to be able to breed successfully. The picture on the left there is a downy woodpecker and it's on some goldenrod. Um, it's not there for the goldenrod seed, it's actually there for the goldenrod gall. There's a little fly that lays an egg um, in there and it develops uh, this gall and the woodpecker will come along and peck on that gall and get the little grub out of there to eat it. So um, native plants are, are critical for uh, helping uh, our birds to make it through the winter. So when it comes uh, to the fall, it's the time to decide to leave your weeds for the winter wildlife. Um, tall weedy seed heads provide valuable food for wintering birds. Can't say it enough. Is that not proof? All of these pictures of the birds on the seed heads here. Um, looks like a cone flower there, right? Um, spring migrants and year-round residents are also looking for the last seeds come spring. Right now, um, before a lot of other things come out, they're still looking for those seeds on these seed heads. So keeping a messy yard is one way to do it. Now, our tendency is to want to cut everything down once, once it looks dead. But when you think like a bird, remember this thing right over here to my, to, to my right, or excuse me, to my left, I think it's to your right. Um, it looks like it's to my right. Um, when you think like a bird, what is aesthetic to a bird may not always be aesthetic to human eyes. They're looking for survival, right? It's, it's not about making a pretty lawn, it's about survival. And so when you see a messy yard as a bird, you're gonna say seeds and you're gonna go there and you're gonna look and you're gonna look for insects in the leaves that are overwintering. You're gonna look for that uh, pupating uh, caterpillar, right? You're gonna look for the seeds on the, on the seed heads you, and you've got a lot to look for in those areas. So again, messy yards. So when you leave your yard messy, here's a, here's a few suggestions that I found um, to help you out. Um, leave your leaves on the property. Don't rake them all up. Leave, leave leaves covering the ground because there's insects hidden in them, there's seeds hidden in them. Um, allow the gorgeous dried flower heads to stay standing in your garden. Let the grass grow tall and go to seed even. Um, build a brush pile, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and and uh, uh, with fallen, fallen branches instead of removing them. Um, forget the chemicals. Obviously, I think we're all advocates of, of not using chemicals on our lawns. Um, leave snags on your property, which we'll talk about next and delay gardening cleanup until later on in the spring, until maybe mid-spring. This, this even seems a little bit early, the suggestion that I found here is after several 50 degree, 50 degree days uh, to wait until then before uh, you do a little cleanup in your, in your, yard, in your yard. I think the later the better um, to allow for those overwintering insects to wake up and, and go about their business producing more insects for, uh, for the summer and for next year. And then the next thing is snags, like I mentioned. Um, snags are really important. And I, I mean, not just your dead trees. 
um, not just fully dead trees, but also the branches on trees that are dead. Um, they're great for perching. I see there's a there's a the top of a tree of my in my neighbor's yard. It's not threatening anything. is is dead, and the birds love to perch up on top of it just to get a, a lay of the landscape around. Um, the woodpeckers in particular like it. Um, they can use it for drumming too. Um, they also can use it for foraging. Woodpeckers in particular will forage uh, for the insects inside of the dead trees or the dead branches, um, but other birds will also glean things off of the bark that's remaining on there and uh, benefit from it as well. It also provides shelter. If a woodpecker makes a hole in it, um, that can provide shelter not only for the woodpecker, but also for chickadees or titmice or other uh, cavity nesting species in the future. So very valuable um, to have on your property. Of course, the ultimate question when it comes to leaving snags is to cut or not to cut. And that, that's uh, safety first, right? You don't want to put your, yourselves in danger or your property um, in danger. If something's leaning towards your house, you might uh, opt to still cut it down. So that, that choice obviously is up to you, but if, if something is, is up and you're cutting it down only because it's dead, um, reconsider. If it's not threatening anything or anybody's safety, you might wanna keep it up because it will be a benefit to the birds. So on to water, speaking of water. I'm gonna take a little sip myself. I gotta keep myself refreshed just like the birds do. Um, keeping birds uh, refreshed and clean, how do we effectively provide water for birds? That's the big question um, because it's not just putting a bowl of water out there for them to, to be happy. We've got to think like a bird in how they're going to utilize it and how they're going to access it. And that's the thing, right? I've been saying all, all over, why? Over and over and over, why water? It's because, well, let's figure it out by thinking like a bird. Don't forget, think like a bird. If you want the birds to be happy, think like them and attract them by, by thinking like them. So first of all, they're gonna use it for drinking. They gotta stay hydrated. Then they're gonna use it for bathing, okay? That's pretty easy, you, you all know that, right? Sure, okay, that seems pretty simple. So why are we even talking about this? Well, it's not so much the why they need it, just like they need food, right? We all know that, we all need food, but it's the how can you give it to them so that they can use it. And the how do we do water that is important to make it effective to attract birds to your yard. First of all, noise and movement is really important to attract birds to your, to your yard. And then second, access for the birds, getting them to the water. Now, if you look at the picture here, um, it's making noise, right? That little fountain, it's a, not really a little fountain, it's a nice big fountain, right? It'd be big for any of our yards probably. It's making a lot of noise, but if you're a bird, how likely are you going to be to go down into that? Or are you going to feel vulnerable getting out into the open, right? So think like a bird. This provides the noise, it, provi it provides the water, it provides the noise, but access is not there. So let's talk about that. How do we provide noise and movement? and also access for birds to get to the water. This is some of the real critical stuff that I think um, is great in, in uh, uh, providing habitat for birds, is when we start to put these puzzle pieces together of how does habitat intersect with providing food and how does habitat intersect with providing water. And that's why I had that that triad, that triangle up there, that when all three of those things are working in concert, then you have uh, happy birds. So do you want this, like I was saying, or do you want something like this? Now, if from a human perspective, you might say, oh, but that other one was so aesthetically pleasing. But if your purpose is to attract birds, it has to be aesthetically pleasing for birds. And that doesn't mean that those aren't mutually exclusive. And, and, and uh, you can make a yard that's pretty aesthetically to our eyes as well as to the birds. That takes some talent and that takes some talent that I'm, I'm gonna need help at uh, as well. But 
when I'm talking about these things, I'm, I'm really trying to take a, a more bird-centered uh, utilitarian view from the bird, right? Um, so you can glean from this what you want, but your setup doesn't have to look exactly like what my setup is. Um, and so you can tweak it to your own yard to make it aesthetically as well as uh, aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing to humans as well as to birds. So moving water is key to attracting birds. And that's because moving water, I think you all can hear that, moving water is like a megaphone to birds. And you can only have that if you have a creek running through your yard or if you use some sort of a pump. And using a pump, um, like what you see at the bottom of the screen, is, is uh, really helpful. If you have a pond, you have the pump down at the bottom and you can get these pumps. And I'll just stop that uh, music here a second. Oh, maybe I won't stop the music. See if I can get the sound to go. Can you all hear me? Let me know if you can't hear me, if the, if the sound is too, too high on this one. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, circulating pump. If you can hear me good, I'll, I'll speak up a little bit too. But the circulating pump is down at the bottom of the pond. You can get these for, okay, great. <laughs> you're enjoying, I, I see your comment there. You're enjoying being out on the pond, all right. Great, excellent, thank you. Um, I realized that that sound, I didn't want it to drown me out there. Um, the, the circulating pump down at the bottom, you can get these for $50, $75, you can get them on Amazon or you can get them at your local hardware stores. Um, and they pump water through that tube and then you can, uh, there's a, a flexible tube that you can aim to dump back into the pond. So it's circulating the water through and it provides a little bit of a waterfall. When you get a waterfall effect, then you get the noise. So don't just circulate it um, and and put it back into the into the pond. You need to let it do let gravity do its business and and uh, let it make the noise. The noise is critical. Like I said, it's, it's like the megaphone. Um, so the best options to do that are with a, a little pump like this. And you can do a big setup, you can do a little setup. You can see this, this I have here, this is from one of my uh, previous yards that uh, no longer live there, but but it's only about four feet long, the, the black tub there. You can get those at your local hardware store. Um, especially, I like to go at the end of the season when they're trying to get rid of stuff and then it's a little cheaper. Um, but you can get a nice tub or you can even get a, a vinyl or a, uh, uh, black plastic sheeting that uh, you can dig a hole and you can you can use the sheeting and then you can uh, um, get a really nice thick gauge uh, sheeting and then you can put rocks around it to landscape around it and you can use something like that um, whatever you choose but um, pump the water out and give uh, give it a, a little trickle down over a waterfall and it works really really well if that's not an option that, that is available to you or that, you're, that you don't feel confident in doing, another thing that you can do is use a dripper. And you can see the picture there in the middle on the top where the tufted titmouse is drinking out of the dripper. It doesn't make a whole lot of noise, but what it does do is it creates ripples on the surface of the water, which can also be a visual cue to birds and help attract them in too. So, so that's an option. Um, and that's why there's also this vibrating uh, uh, thing that's a battery operated. Some of them are solar powered. Um, and you stick it in your bird bath and it vibrates and it makes ripples. And so even when you can't make noise, maybe you can even just create ripples and then that visual cue will draw them for dinner. Some people might get inventive and if you can't do a big water feature like this with a waterfall, maybe you get a recording of water flowing like this and have a little outdoor speaker out there near your bird bath. That could work. So I've never tried it, but uh, um, you, you might be the first, and if it works, I'd love to hear from you and see, see if that actually works. My theory is is right that that would that, that would uh, attract the birds in. Um, and then moving on, not only movement. Remember that 
uh, that uh, Victorian style uh, fountain, but we also need access. Access. Notice in this picture, I've got it's coming down into the water. It's built partially underneath a brush pile and some shrubbery, okay? So that the birds have access to the back here and can actually move into the water without going into the open. Leading from your brush pile or from your shrubs or from wherever it is is, is a critical way to, to, to getting birds into your bird bath. Don't put it in the middle of your yard, put it up against the edge of your yard. Um, where there's the most shelter and the most access all the way to the canopy. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But think about stair steps that lead all the way to the canopy. And that's some of the best places to put your bird bath is where you have uh, branches and, and shelter all the way to the canopy. So that's why I said access from above, stick pathways into your water. I intentionally take these sticks and put them strategically in places so that the birds can easily get down into the water. And I'm gonna show you a video here in a, in a moment that will illustrate that, because um, it's better a video than, than just me talking, because then you can actually see it. But um, those stick pathways, sometimes I'll even take a broken branch and stick it in the ground next to the bird bath as a perching place so that they can sit and look at it and decide if they wanna go in or not. Because sometimes that's what it takes. They're, they're very, birds can be very tentative when it comes to going into a bird bath. So we'll put it in also in, a, in an area that has uh, low amounts of, of traffic. So it's not, um, not uh, there's not a lot of human activity there constantly all day long. So right next to your sidewalk might not be the best place to do it. Um, give, think like a bird, think like a bird. Where are you gonna feel safest? If you're gonna be vulnerable to take a bath or get a drink, you're putting your head down to the water or you're fluffing around in the water, so you cannot see anything going around on, uh, going on around you. And if you're thinking cat, if you're thinking hawks, if you're thinking anything that might do you harm, you're going to be very jittery when it goes uh, uh, when it comes to water. So, really, really important to provide them safe and comfortable access into the water. Also, um, think about varying depth. No bird is the same size, right? Blue jays and cardinals and, and chickadees, they're all different sizes. Robins, vary the depth of your water as much as you can. Put little rocks in um, to make shallow areas. Um, I have deeper areas in there too for robins. And keep your water fresh and clean too. Depending on the size of your bird bath, um, you know, it could be that you, you want to empty it every day or every two to three days. Um, that you, you need to have a professional service come out and actually service your big, your big uh, bird bath. Um, with something this size, um, it's good to just kind of keep an eye on it. And when you see that it's getting a little dirty and that it's been used a lot, when it's used a lot, you have to clean it more often. That's why it's hard to put a certain um, amount of time on it. Um, but birds are not clean bathers. They, they will do their uh, duty in, in the water and things, and you want to avoid that. That, of course, paints the water, it doesn't make it as attractive to themselves. I wish they could figure that out and not do that, but they don't. Um, so just make sure that, that you're aware of that and that you, if you're putting water out for birds, that you um, be intentional about caring for that water, even more than you would for your bird feeder. So watch this four minute video um, where I talk a bit about my current setup in my own backyard. Here we go. Let's see if that gets started, and I'll mute myself. Finished putting all the rocks in to this end. Also notice I've got strategically placed sticks leading from my brush pile into the bird bath. This gives them a pathway to the water and gives them more comfort as they come in to bathe or to drink. Over here I have my pump tube leading to my waterfall, which is just a gutter extension that I found at a local hardware store and works great. Here's my brush pile. It's, in, it's a conglomeration of a Christmas tree and a lot of other brush that has fallen out of my trees over, over time. Clippings that I've taken from shrubs in the yard, 
I have a couple of structural boards that I hang things from, and that's because I need to build up the brush pile high to reach up into the trees. Because when the birds come in into the trees, they'll come into your bird bath down on the ground a whole lot more readily if they have a pathway continuously all the way down to the bird bath. I think I'm ready to fill it up and see if this runs like it should. Even as I stood watching the pond fill, this brave male cowbird came in for a look and for a drink. All just a very few feet away from me. I'm hopeful this is a good sign of things to come. Now, let's see if we can get this to work. Well, it's off and running without a hitch. Notice the varying depths of water from shallow here for birds like warblers and sparrows to a little deeper for birds like cardinals to even deeper over here for birds like blue jays or robins. They may also choose to take a bath or get a drink right in the waterfall itself. Also note that the sound that this waterfall creates helps to attract birds to your bird bath. Now that we're all set up, let's see once what happens and what birds were able to attract to the yard using the bird bath. Okay, so that hopefully gets, gives you a little bit of a clue as to how it works and how quickly it works because that actually happened, those, those clips happened not long after I, I set it up. And I know that I'm not, a, I'm not a real big fan of cowbird, but if it illustrates how quickly a bird will come into a feeder, um, then, then great. Um, so. Um, while I'm not necessarily aiming to, to attract cowbirds, um, which are nest parasites and, and uh, debatably invasive in our area, um, it illustrates that this method works. Because that video I took of the, of the uh, brown-headed cowbird was literally with my iPhone, and he was standing right underneath me three feet, three feet away. I had only just started filling the, <laughs> the pond. So um, it works. Um, notice my, my little setup here also with uh, the blood root. I have some, some nice woodland wildflowers in my, uh, around my uh, bird bath, including ginger as well. And uh, so that's a nice ground cover um, and provides some nice beauty around there as well. But with these pictures, I wanted to show you some of the other species uh, that come into the bird bath. Because this, when we talk water, we're talking beyond just the birds that come to your bird feeder. Okay? We're talking migrants. Um, 
and we're 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 talking um, other local, uh, not just local feeder birds, but but migrants and non feeder birds in particular. So um, the pictures that you see here, we've got some of your normal uh, everyday robin, chickadee, right? But now look in the the top center. There's a white crowned sparrow. Below that in the middle is a white throated sparrow. These are birds that don't breed in our area, but that move through. They might come to your feeders as well. They like to eat seeds, they're sparrows. Um, so they could come to your feeder, but they could also be attracted to the water. And they're more likely to come to your feeders if you have water. Now the bird on the left there is a yellow rump warbler. That bird does not come to your bird feeder unless it maybe will come to suet. Um, and I have another video, which you see up uh, in the upper left corner, which there, there'll be a link um, on the resources um, that you can watch that too, where a uh, yellow rump warbler came into the bird bath there and takes a bath. So um, that is truly a migrant um, that would not even come to my, to my bird feeders at all because they don't eat seeds, they're insectivorous. So some other birds at even at previous places uh, that I've lived, I've taken pictures along the way. And now this goes to show that I didn't have professional equipment, <laughs> but it, it shows, it proves that the setup that, I, that I'm using does attract a lot of variety of birds that wouldn't otherwise come into your feeder. So do you all see the uh, scarlet tanager there, the red bird with the black wings? Um, the picture next to that is a red-eyed vireo um, on the left. Um, and then it is uh, a Nashville warbler. And in the bath, there is a black-throated green warbler. So this is in May when birds are coming through. And these little oasis, oases are really important for migratory birds, um, especially if you're in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an urban habitat, which is where I took these pictures. I was in an urban habitat. And these birds had very limited resources and places to go to get what they needed to refuel and refresh for the continued journey. So May is a really, April and May really are critical months uh, for providing these things for the birds. You might just be helping a bird get to its breeding grounds up north. Well, think about that. All the way from the tropic up into the northern boreal forests of Canada. And the next picture um, is of Swainson's thrushes. Uh, this is in fall migration. So September um, is really a, a critical month for uh, water and bird baths and things again um, when birds are heading south. And this is when we tend to get a lot of splints and thrushes. I, one of my yards, I had a number of them in the bath. Can you count them? Can you see, see if you can count them all before I, I put the circles up on there? And this picture here, did you see them all? There's two in the one, so one, two, three, four, five, of them, and I actually had seven or eight at the same time, but I couldn't get them all in the picture, which was pretty incredible. Uh, I'll never forget that. And this picture of a Swainson's thrush on the left here was just, it's in my current suburban neighborhood. So I don't have anything special in my yard other than I've got a basswood tree that, that is the big tree that was right next to my, to my uh, bird bath and to my brush pile, and I get a good variety of birds visiting the bird bath. So a couple of pictures of the Nature Center before I move on. Um, here's the bird bath at the Nature Center from the front. Uh, nice big setup. You may not have the time or resources to try to do something like this, but wanted to show it anyways. This is what you would see out of the, the window at the, at the Nature Center. And here's the top, there's an intake. Um, and then that's where the waterfall, where the water comes up and spills out. Lots of nice uh, trickling noises. Um, and notice how this picture from the top shows how it connects back into the brush pile behind. Always have those sticks, um, the stick pathways to your water, giving them access. Did you notice in the video too, how those birds were using the sticks oftentimes, like a little chickadee was sitting on that stick and thinking about jumping in, then he finally jumps in. That uh, goldfinch was sitting on the stick to, to reach in and get a drink. So um, sticks are really important. Um, and real quickly, in the winter, you can get uh, heating elements. You can get them built into smaller uh, bird baths like this one, um, or you can get uh, a heating element that you can put down into your bird bath and keep it uh, warm. Um, you wanna just 
hey, special mind, you're probably going to need to have daily attention to that so that it doesn't evaporate. And um, also the amount of traffic you'll get on it will often uh, soil it pretty quickly. So you got to keep a close eye on it. Um, also movement does help to keep water open, um, but I take down my bird bath for the winter uh, in my backyard and I'll put out a heated bird bath um, with a, a internal coil uh, to keep it warm during the winter. But if you think about it, it's harder to access water for birds in the winter. They will melt snow and, and get water that way, but it's a little nicer if, if a bird can actually just get fresh water, especially for bathing purposes. So um, fresh open water, um, and the winter time is a, a real nicety for birds. And if you want a native planting for water, the cup plant is your plant, right? It's got a nice, it's a nice natural watering hole where the leaf clasps to the stem. Um, it creates a little cup that holds rainwater. And if you don't get a whole lot of rain, well, guess what? If you've got this in your yard, you can even pour water in there yourself. Um, and the birds will come in and drink out of it. The insects like it as well. So lastly, shelter, helping birds have, uh, have safe and, uh, access, to feel safe and have access to the food and to the water, like what we've been talking about. So this kind of puts together some of those concepts that I've been talking about. So why shelter? It's become pretty obvious right now, right? I'm going to tell you to think like a bird. And if you're a bird, you want shelter for protection, safety, comfort in weather, to get out of the snow in the winter, things like that, out of the rain, and also to give you access to food and water. So that completes the triad there, and shelter becomes that connecting factor that really helps to get birds to eat your food and utilize your water. So do you want a yard that looks like what that is? There's not a whole lot surrounding that water, um, or would you rather your yard look like this, where we've got uh, species of uh, plants that go all the way up to the canopy, stair-stepping. Um, we've got food all around. We've got a brush pile behind. Um, and so there's lots to attract the bird and give them comfort and safety in accessing what you're giving. Layering the habitats, like I was just saying, canopy up there where the scarlet tanager is, to the mid-story, we got this berry bush um, to the brush pile and even to the ground cover, really important. Here's a few pictures. Um, building a brush pile, how do, how do you layer it? Um, you wanna layer it upward, like I said. That's looking up the basswood tree in my yard. Um, and you can see how I built it up. Even in the video, you can see how I built it up. I structured it and hung branches off of those boards. Um, and it's falling apart a little bit. I'm going to probably need to restructure a little bit this, this spring, but every spring you should uh, kind of revamp it a little bit. Everything settles over winter in particular with all the snow. But you also um, want to uh, make sure that when you're making uh, a brush pile that you layer for spaces, that you don't just pile it on top of each other, but that you be intentional about how you build it so that you have bigger branches that are holding up smaller branches and creating spaces, caverns inside where those birds can go and feel safe where a hawk could not necessarily get in fast enough to get at, at the bird. So create spaces inside. Here's another picture. Um, this is my current yard. I took this actually as the snow was melting the other day and that's 60 degrees, um, but I wanted to show how I had built it up this year. I have two Christmas trees. So here's some ideas. Um, two Christmas trees, they work great. Um, this is the one on the right is the one from last year and then and or from 2019, yeah. And then the one on the left is from uh, 2020 this year. Um, I may move that around a little bit this spring, but for winter in particular, it's really important. And then I also have a lot of thick cover on the top and that the snow held that and the birds could go hide underneath in there in those cavernous spaces. So I have some work to do on my bird bath for the spring yet, but I wanted to give you a, a, a look at that. And then from a bird's perspective, you want access to the water, right? So this is looking from the uh, waterfall back into the brush pile. So you can see that there's pathways to that water. And at the nature center, the bird feeder brush pile is um, fairly hidden. So this might be one way that you can do that without causing too much uh, um, in the way of, of uh, a non-aesthetic yard, right? A brush pile is one of those things that people are like, I don't know, because it doesn't 
look very good. Um, it, it looks messy. Um, and I understand that. So at the Nature Center, where is the brush pile? You can see it a little bit, but not a whole lot. And it's not obvious from the front side because we've got a cover of greenery and shrubs, um, which these are actually hemlocks. Um, and, uh, but if you were to go behind and look back at the window for the wildlife den, you would see this. So it's kind of hidden back behind a berm, back behind some greenery. Um, you don't have to look at your brush pile. Um, you can kind of hide it, be strategic about how you hide it. Um, but these little caverns around these Christmas trees and things um, are uh, wonderful bird attractors. And here's another picture here from the side view. You can see all the caverns that those birds can get in and the feeders are just to the right off this picture. So it gives them a great place. They can perch up on these uh, branches on the top here and go right into the feeders. Um, it uh, gives them a lot of uh, safety and comfort coming into the feeders. And a real quick mention here is that bird boxes are also shelter. Um, if you wanna look at more on uh, bird boxes themselves, um, go to nestwatch.org. It's a site through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is a very good trusted source for bird information. Um, they'll, they have all kinds of information on how to make bird boxes um, and uh, much more information than I have time to give you uh, tonight. So, but they provide nesting uh, for, for birds, for your local nesting species, but also seasonal shelter for the winter. So this Eastern speech owl on the right um, is coming up to the box hole there in the nice rare sunshine that we get in the, in the midwinter to warm up, but they use those for wintering. Um, and also they use them for nesting, but uh, bluebirds also use uh, bluebird boxes and layer themselves inside to keep each other warm during the winter. Um, so if you're lucky and you get to see them exiting their, their boxes in the morning, you may see multiple uh, bluebirds exiting out of one box. And some native plantings for shelter. Um, these are some suggestions. It gets to be a little bit difficult when talking about evergreens, but the cedars, both the Eastern red and white cedars are, are good choices, not necessarily for, for food so much as it is for cover because they keep the greenery on. Um, but you may also want to, uh, oh, they, they also are, are uh, sun loving. So there's not a whole lot of shade loving evergreen that you can find um, native to this area. So that becomes a little bit of a difficulty. But if you've got enough sun, you might try the, the cedars. Uh, vines also can be a good way to cover your brush piles. Um, and also climb up your, your, uh, your tree trunks. And when it climbs up your tree trunks, it provides them more, provides birds more access down to, to your brush pile. So riverbank grape, Virginia creeper, American bittersweet, and that is American bittersweet, um, not oriental. There is a native um, and those are all good options. Um, and they're right on down the line here. So on the right side of the screen, that's the red cedar. Then uh, middle is the white cedar, You've got the grape, here, Virginia creeper in the middle here. This is the bittersweet up at the top. Um, then moving from left to right, we've got the uh, strawberry, wild strawberry for, for ground cover. Wild ginger, um, that's what I have as a ground cover around my bird bath. Um, and even bearberry or kinnikinick um, is a good ground cover too. Um, ostrich fern or other ferns um, that may not require as much moisture. Ostrich fern tends to do pretty good um, in drier soils. So that may be a good way to provide some greenery and ground cover during the spring or during the summertime in particular. So with that, um, I want to reiterate that the goal is to use these three elements, food, water, and shelter, in order to turn angry birds in your yard, right? Hopefully you don't have angry birds in your yard, into happy birds. No matter your location, urban, suburban, rural, um, using these methods and thinking like a bird, finding food, water, and shelter, providing food, water, and shelter, and providing it in the right ways and the adequate ways um, to give them access. Remember, use shelter to provide access to the food and access to the water. When you do that, it will really help you to enjoy the bird life more in your yard because it's, it's about providing for the birds, for themselves, 
um, for their survival, but it's also about our enjoyment of it too. Um, I love birds, I love bird watching, and um, that is part of it. So when considering where to put these things, that's also a factor, is where can you see it and enjoy it from your home uh, as well in your yard. Um, here's a few of the resources that uh, will be sent uh, to you. Um, so you don't have to memorize any websites or anything, but that Michigan Audubon website will take you to a site that uh, will give you access to two different PDFs. One is Michigan Native Plants uh, for Bird-Friendly Landscapes, and it has this chart down here um, that, that tells you all about what, what species to pick for seeds, berries, shrubbery for cover, or um, insect to attract insects. It lays it all out. Um, it tells you the sizes, the, the uh, amount of light that each plant uh, would need. It's a really, really great resource because it connects it directly to birds. Um, so utilize that. But also if you want to go beyond that, there's also a Michigan Native Garden design for birds. So this, this uh, actually has several different designs that were submitted uh, to Michigan Audubon and being specific to uh, certain yard situations that you have, whether it be a sunny yard or um, a suburban pond oasis, you know, those are the two examples here, but there, were, there are more in that booklet. So go to the Michigan Audubon website and look for those PDFs um, and uh, you can download them yourselves. They're free resources. Also, don't forget about Doug Tallamy and his book, Bringing Nature Home, but he also has a website called Homegrown National Park which is highlighting the fact that it doesn't have to be a national park to be helpful to critters. And you can learn how to make your, uh, more about how to make your yard um, attractive to wildlife, um, including insects and birds. Um, and you can also uh, 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 put your, your yard on the map. And he's trying to get a certain number of acreage um, in the end to, to uh, he's got a goal at a certain number of acreage that will total up across the United States as habitat, homegrown habitat uh, for, for insects and birds. So you can go to the Homegrown National Park website there that is Doug Tallamy's website. If you wanna buy native plants, go to the Ottawa and Kent Conservation District websites. They've got plant sales coming up this spring. Um, there is, uh, a seedling sale for Ottawa County coming up right away in April. So go to the websites, those are linked in the, in the uh, resources uh, PDF that I'm sending out. Um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, like I said, great place to find out bird, any information about birds, whether you wanna know what a bird sounds like when it sings or how to identify it or where it likes to nest and things like that, allaboutbirds.org is your online bird identification and information resource. They also um, have, uh, Cornell also has Project Feeder Watch and Project Nest Watch. Those are great uh, ways to learn more about how to feed birds um, and how to uh, have them nest in your own yards and use that information um, for citizen science um, for data um, that will help us to understand birds better. A couple of other ones that I don't have on here are ebird.org. If you're interested in tracking the birds at your feeder, you can. You can do uh, checklists on eBird um, and also Merlin. There's a Merlin bird ID app that's free. You can get it on your phone and it helps you to identify birds. You just enter in a season and a location and some things about the bird that you noticed and it'll come up with a list of potential birds that it is. Um, and then you can scroll through it and it narrows it down real well. So if you don't know your birds real well, that's a really helpful resource, Merlin bird ID. Um, I could go on, but I know I shouldn't. <laughs> we talk about birds until the cows come home, but um, the cowbirds come home. <laughs> but uh, one more thing that I wanted to, to tell you about before I take some questions, and I realize I'm running out of time, I apologize, but uh, we, can, we can do more, more uh, questions here. Ottawa County Parks, go to the website. We've got all kinds of birding resources and videos, um, as you see the ones listed down there on the right-hand side. Um, we, we do have in-person programming coming up um, and you can register online. All of our programs need pre-registration. We're doing bird walks this spring and other bird related programming and, and wildflowers too, wildflower walks. Um, and in the summer we'll be, do, be doing prairie wildflower walks at the nature center. Um, coffee with the birds. If you're interested in coffee with the birds and watching some of the episodes of uh, watching the birds at the feeders at the nature center, you can go on to um, it's listed on the resource site there. 
uh, but you can go to the Coffee with the Birds website and access the four different episodes that there are. They're all about an hour and a half to two hours long, but you can uh, sift through it as you like um, and uh, enjoy the birds at the feeder and me talking about different topics of birds and birding in the area. Um, also, if you're interested in staying connected to what we're doing in particular with birds, you can join the birding update email list and there's a link on, on the PDF and I send out at least monthly emails to the group with uh, other connections to birding resources and, and things of interest. So with that, I know that was a little fast and furious, but you can sift through that, that resources page um, uh, when you get it. Um, so with that, I wish you all happy yard birding. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, opportunity to speak to you tonight for your River City Wild Ones meeting. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, I would like to open it up to any questions that you have. Um, all right, thanks so much, Curtis. That was a great program. So many good ideas about how to bring birds into our um, yard. They, we have a few questions, so I'm gonna start with them and, and whatever ones we don't uh, get to, we will um, try and make sure you answer them and maybe we can send, it, send the answers out in that um, follow-up email. So, Absolutely. And, yeah, and also I want to remind you guys that um, in the chat box, there is a link to Curtis's resource list and it will also come in the email, the follow-up email that you're gonna get. So, okay, um, Judith Clifton has a question. She said, um, she is recently seeing a tufted tip mouse. How do I keep it in my backyard? Tufted tip mice are one of the, um, the three uh, birds that like to hang out with black hat chickadee, white breasted nuthatch, and tufted titmouse. So, and they're they're pretty brave birds to come into feeders just about anywhere. Um, they're some of the first birds to come in. But if you want to attract them in particular, peanuts are really uh, attractive. Um, uh, so feed peanuts. See if that if that keeps them uh, holds on to them. I get them periodically at my feeders here, but they're not as common as the black cap chickadee at my feeders. Um, they, they tend to like a little bit more forested areas, uh, but they are in our suburban uh, neighborhoods. I would also say if you want, you could try to put out um, a nest box. You could find out information on the uh, Nest Watch website as to the dimensions for, for one, but they are a cavity nesting bird. So that would be another thing. Um, but uh, beyond that, those are probably some of the best ways to get started, I, I would say, especially the peanuts. That's probably the most practical way to get started is putting peanuts out. That also is attractive to blue jays. <laughs> okay, all right, very good. Another question from John and Jean Van Kamen. Um, in the last few years, downy woodpeckers seem to have become addicted to our hummingbird syrup. Um, we've been feeding birds for 30 years and this has only been an issue in the last five years or so. Is this common? Um, the hummingbirds are getting frightened away. Yeah, you know, woodpeckers, they have long tongues like hummingbirds. And so they're able to get their tongues down into those hummingbird feeders, um, unlike other birds. So once they kind of latch onto that and figure that out, then, then they may continue returning. Um, if the birds don't figure it out, that you may never have a problem with it. But some people will run into that. I might recommend putting up a second feeder um, for the hummingbirds. That would probably be the best way. It's kind of comical to see the the, uh, the woodpeckers on the feeders, but yeah, you you don't want to do it at the expense of not having uh, uh, hummingbirds. So try putting up a second feeder and see if that um, provides an access for the hummingbirds too. Okay, we had a couple questions about how you clean your bird bath, or if you do it, and how often. So well, with the small bird baths. Um, best way to do it is with like a, a vinegar water solution you em empty it out and and brush it out with a get a, a bristle brush with a vinegar water solution uh swipe it um get any any grime off of it and then refill it um with my bird bath i rinse it out so i empty it out after winter time um scrub it down and then and then uh refill it um but keeping fresh water in it uh often enough um Tend, tends to do it. You don't, what you don't need to do necessarily is get a, a bigger bird bath, 100% spick and span from what, what, I've, uh, what I've found is that you don't have to bleach it. You don't have to uh, go to that extent. If you've got a smaller one, it's a lot easier to, to clean more thoroughly. But even with the, with the big ones, um, uh, I, I empty it of dirty water and I get rid of most of the, the 
the gunk off the sides and then I if you've got a real big one you gotta you gotta treat it with chemicals and things like that which I don't go that route I don't I haven't gone that route so I don't know all the ins and outs of treating really large ones but as far as um, mine I know I'm kind of rambling here a second but um, as far as mine you know do that every every couple of weeks or so um, maybe refill your 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 tub of water so that uh, and, and again it depends on how often the birds are, are using it, how heavily it's used. Um, but uh, vinegar water solution, if you want to scrub it down more um, and uh, empty it and put fresh clean water in it. I hope that answers it. You can probably find more specifics on, on uh, the Cornell website. They've got they've got some specifics on their on their website too. Okay. Um, Patricia Pennell was wondering if there's a special kind of water feature that a hummingbird would enjoy. Oh, yeah, you know, actually they like um, uh, little misters. So if you have a, you can get these little drippers that actually if you put pressure behind, um, it'll send out a mist. And they like to bathe uh, in the air by zipping through the mist of the water. So that would be the best option. Sometimes if you're just out spraying, spraying your, your native wildflower garden, um, you may have a hummingbird zip through your, through your uh, water that you're spraying on because that, that's, that's how they like to bathe. Good question. Okay, yeah, that is a good question. Um, Catherine was wondering, how would you do things differently if you were thinking like a flock versus thinking like a single bird? Hmm. That's, that's a hard, that might be a hard one, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, um, and maybe maybe I should say thinking like birds, right? So not necessarily thinking about just individual birds, but like a flock. And and that that brings up an important point that um, when you attract some of the local flocking birds, especially in the off season, so the chickadees, nuthatches, and titmice, they flock together. Um, downy woodpeckers too. They flock together through the winter, through the fall and winter, and into the early spring. And when, when you have them coming to your feeders regularly, that also is an attractant to other birds, other loner birds that are maybe migrating through in the fall or in the winter. Um, because they hear the chickadees and that's, that's their cue to safety. They know that there's a flock of birds there. They know that there's a group of birds that can provide them some protection, um, more eyes and ears looking for, for threats and things. So um, definitely if you're attracting uh, good amounts of your local resident birds that will help in attracting some of the others. Okay. Okay. Um, Lisa was wondering, is quick right cement safe to make a bird bath? That I am not sure. That's a good question. I would, I'm trying to think what would, uh, what resource you could find to answer that question? Because I do not know for certain. Um, I would imagine so, but don't take my word for it. I would look online and at Cornell's website and see if they have suggestions for cement or even just Google, Google search cement, you know, creating your own cement bird bath, because that is another option. Um, it is, is forming cement yourself to, to an area to, to put water in it. But as far as that specific type, I don't know um, if that would be if that would be safe or not for birds. Good question though. You got me curious. I wanna, I, I wanna look that up myself. <laughs> okay, okay. We had a couple questions about seeds um, and plants. Uh, Carol is wondering if zinnias are a good seed source for birds. Uh, I'm, I don't know specifically. I, 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 I really, yeah, I don't know what to, how to answer that one. Cause I, I'm not, not real, not real familiar with if that would attract birds or not. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Catherine was wondering, are sunflower hearts usually black oil or another type of sunflower? Uh, black oil, yeah. Yep, there is a striped sunflower seed, um, but it's a larger seed and it, they don't normally make that hullless. The hullless ones will be the black oil sunflower. Yep. Okay. Okay, um, just a couple more. Carol was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts about the hummingbird food extenders? Oh, um, I have used them and they seem to work all right. Um, you wanna make sure that, that what you're using is, is safe for the bird. So always read the labels, but the one I, I have used in the past, yeah, and I don't have the name of it right offhand, but there's, there's a certain, um, it was an organic, uh, 
thing that you can put into your uh, nectar to make it last longer so that it doesn't spoil uh, as quickly. Normally you would have to, you know, change your, your uh, bird, your, your nectar out every three to four days. Um, that's, uh, that's especially during the, the heat of the summer. But with that, you might be able to go, you know, a week or so um, without it. Um, but yeah, I would be, I would be careful and make sure that, that what you get is, is organic and, and healthy for the birds. But I have used it and it has, has worked pretty well. Okay. Um, Nancy was asking how far away from feeders do shrubs and trees need to be to sustain birds? Uh, good good yeah. question because it's there's obviously a balance that you don't want them right next to the feeder because then um, you know things like squirrels get on them and such. Um, my feeder is probably about you know 15 20 feet from my brush pile and um, but there are some overhanging branches that come out toward my feeder so but that should be good um that's close enough um i don't have specifics or specific recommendations other than based on my own experience with it i just wouldn't put your feeders right next to the bushes but a, a far enough away so that squirrels can't jump from them um, but then that distance is fine for for comfort for birds to come into your feeder specifically. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, but yeah, it's it's a balancing act. So too close, not good. But too far away, obviously not good either. So just as close as you as you can without squirrels or other things being able to access it. If that makes it, that's probably the best way I can answer that. <laughs> okay. All right. I think that's about all the questions that we oh, have. Wow. Yeah, I know. Pretty good. Um, so, Curtis, I want to thank you again for um, your awesome presentation. It was really great. I learned so much. Um, and thanks to all of you that um, have joined us tonight. Um, I want to remind you that our next program is April 19th. It's titled Native Garden Design, and it will be presented by um, Amy Heilman and Rebecca Marquardt. Um, these guys are landscape designers and also Wild Ones members. So it should be another great program. Curtis, thanks again. It was great. And um, hope you all have a good evening. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Good night. You're welcome. And thank you again. Thank you all for joining.